Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a open records training presentation. My name is Evan Thompson. I'm an attorney senior with the Department of Law. Um, I've seen and e I've uh, emailed with a bunch of you, I'm sure. I've seen um, probably just as many. So it's good to see you all. It's good to uh, put uh, uh, faces with email addresses. And um, always happy to help if you ever need anything uh, open records related. Um, so we haven't had an open records presentation in a few years. Um, obviously, the state of the world was happening at the time. It took a little bit before uh, we uh, got back to uh, to uh, um, meeting in large groups. We're obviously times we're we're obviously in a time period where we can do that again. So we are back, and uh, a lot of people were asking for training uh, so, and uh, some turnover. So we'll let's uh, we can uh, we provide some training to you today. So hopefully this is helpful. Um, you know, I was uh, watching the other day the uh, D23 presentation with Disney and announcing all those Disney Park stuff, and they were cheering after everything. So I imagine that's very similar to how you're going to be acting today. So, you know, I, I imagine you all have the same exuberance, exuberance for open records that Disney fans have to new park experiences. So please... So please, no, so please hold your uh, applause and, uh, you know, standing ovations and all that stuff until after the presentation. I would really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try my best. Uh, previous years, we've had over 100 slides. I cut it down to 50 for your pleasure uh, and mine. And um, so we'll, hopefully we'll be able to get this, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, also in, in previous years, We've uh, went paragraph by paragraph of our open records policy um, as, as if you couldn't read. Um, and I know you can, so we're not going to do that this year. We're going to be try to do be more practical um, as going through from, from receiving a request to providing the final um, letter. Um, try to be more practical. I think that might be more helpful than going through a paragraph by paragraph open records policy, of course. Um, We'll uh, first start out with, you know, because it's important to always make sure you, when you start a presentation to show, to build camaraderie and uh, build everybody up. Your importance is always is in the process. It will be discussed first. You're all very important. Uh, policy, uh, CAO policy 8R is also going to be discussed. Uh, that's our open records policy, um, but it's not going to be discussed in great, as great detail as it was in previous ones. Instead, like I said, we're going to be doing more of a practical application. Hopefully, it's practical, more practical. Um, the next, we're going to be going into the steps to how to fulfill an open records request. I imagine some of you are new um, who might not um, have been fulfilling open records requests for very long, and we're in a division that doesn't have too many. Uh, so it's, you know, when you get something, it's like, oh, no, what's happening? So I'll try to walk you through that. Um, and then also some common exception, exemptions that uh, apply to, uh, to records before you provide them. So first, you know, you are important. I just want to make sure you all understand that. Very important. Uh, we value you very much in this process. Each department, so every department and division, an office in the government has an open records custodian and a backup open records custodian, and you're them. So that's um, statutorily required, so uh, it's, your, your job's very important. You are in charge of fulfilling uh, and responding to open records requests that relate to your division. And why, and, and, it, and it's important, you know, not only because it's statutorily required, but also because it's actually in the public interest. We might, you know, groan when we get one, right? Or, oh, no, we've got to look through all of those records to try to find something. But it's in the public interest, at least according to the state statute. Um, but in reality, it really is. You know, it allows people to uh, see what we do, see that we're effective, and that we do good work for the, for the city and for the community. Um, and without it, you know, it would be more difficult to show that. So we cannot fulfill our statutory responsibility without you. So thank you. And then we'll go on to the Department of Law. It's responsibilities. So we assist in interpreting the requirements of the Open Records Act and also uh, help you uh, form responses uh, and review responses when requested. Um, but ultimately, custodians, whose primary role in the process is, uh, is to respond and fulfill requests. 
Alrighty, CAO policy 8R, like I said, is our open records policy. We've had it for quite a while now. Um, I'm going to be asking the <coughs> council clerk to provide a copy of uh, CAO policy 8R to all of you. Um, it's also on the internet, or it's not on the internet, it's, it's on the internet. Um, you can find it um, by going into the, there's a CAO policy section of the website, it's policy 8R. And we'll be making sure we provide a copy to all of you if you don't already have it. I think it answers a pretty good amount of questions you might have. And if not, then always ask uh, the Department of Law if you have any other questions. It largely contains three sections, um, open records in general, the procedure, and the exemptions. So you know, I'll be discussing the, the, the open records requests in general, very generally, and then I will go into the other two um, when discussing the practical application of all of them. Like I said, I'm not going to be going like I did in previous years, uh, paragraph through paragraph through the open records policy because you know you can all read that um, trying to add something to your knowledge here so open records in general it's the first section of the policy it explains the purpose of the open records act it's right the public's right to be informed as to what the government's doing by monitoring our effectiveness and they can do that by requesting documents and records uh, from us it outlines how lfucg Maintain, uh, manages open records requests. Obviously, like I mentioned, we implemented a system of custodians and backup custodians in each division uh, and department uh, to uh, more uh, effectively and quickly respond to open records requests than, than, than a model that might require one person or two people or three people to do all of the open records requests, uh, respond to all the open records requests on behalf of all of the government because um, you know, some divisions have quite a lot and some do not. Um, so it'd be quite a big responsibility. Also, uh, I think it's important to make sure everybody understands too that council clerk maintains a list of custodians and backup custodians. So please make sure you keep that list updated. If anything, it, for, especially for the division directors who might be out here um, or, or commissioners, uh, that if, if a custodian or backup custodian leaves to update the, who, that, who the new custodian or backup custodian is going to be, uh, with the council clerk. Um, also, if a if a custodian or a backup custodian somehow gets sick or is out for an extended amount of time, to update who the who the new contact should be is going to be while that person's absent. So that way, if the council clerk receives requests, it goes to the right person. The custodian list is available on the intranet. There's there's an open records tab and it has all that information. Um, on that so we can and if you have any question as to who the custodian is in your in your division or backup custodian the council clerk um, will have that information as well and then also it gives some helpful general advice that um, i'll be also sharing in this presentation as well uh, there's a couple of important things that i wanted to mention that's that's discussed in this section but i wanted to make sure it was highlighted for all of you uh, and the first one is an open records log we're required to uh, keep an open records log uh, of each request that the division receives. Um, so every custodian has to keep a log. The log must contain the date uh, the request was received, the assigned log number, the name of the requester, a brief explanation of the request, and the date or dates a responsive letter was sent. <clears throat> so that's, that's required and it's, uh, by the CAO policy. It's also required by state law. And we're required to keep it for five years. And you must also keep the open records request and the responsive correspondence for a year. So please keep your log for five years and also keep your re requests and responses for a year. Now, I, primarily a lot, a lot of requests, from what I understanding, are coming in email or electronically. Obviously, you're responding electronically through email probably most of a lot of the time. Um, so that, that, you know, to make sure to save the, the email and the, and the letter attachment in your records for the year. Um, but I think email helps because we tend to keep emails for uh, at least, you know, within the last year. So that's always uh, makes it a little bit easier for us. And then I think also important to mention that we can accept oral requests for some records. And it's sometimes it's easier in those instances to, to do it that way instead of going through the formal open records policy uh, written responses. And I'll explain a little bit why. So if you're certain that a, a record is open, then you can release it without requiring a written open records request, uh, like ordinances, obviously, open bids, time records, 
work orders, policies, unless they're security related, and then obviously stuff that's discussed or adopted at an open session of, the count of a council or a public meeting. So that's you know stuff that is obviously open. Um, you don't have to make them do an open records request. And why is that good or easier for you? It's because they're not formal open records requests under the law, so you don't have to send a written response back. It's instead of, for instance, if somebody wanted an ordinance, you wouldn't make them do a written, written request. You would just give them the ordinance. Then you wouldn't have to send a response saying, here's your ordinance. You just give it to them and you're done. Um, of course, you should, not, you should only do that when it's absolutely certain that the responsive document is not exempt under the Open Records Act and it's readily available. So if there's a question as to whether or not a record is, you should request that the, re uh, the requester put it in writing. It's not proper to allow a requester to review a document and then make them send a request in order to take the document home. So the next part of this presentation is, is, is the more practical uh, um, going from getting a request to sending a, a response letter. Now that we have a better idea of Open Records Act and you know, your importance and what's important um, to keep the log and also for, for some things that are obviously open, you don't necessarily have to require them to make a written request. Uh, now we'll go into what happens if you do. The first step is to, and this is a, this is a no brainer, right? You receive it, right? And this is difficult stuff, right? I'm, I'm starting easy, it's gonna get harder. You gotta receive it first, right? So a, a requester can send an open records request by mail, fax, hand delivery, or through electronic means, and that's either email or through an electronic form. Uh, if, you send, if a requester sends it via email, at this point, and I think it might change for police and fire in the near future, but not right now, for email, you, re, you send the request to ORR at LexingtonKY.gov. Then the council clerk will forward the request if it relates to your division. If, if a member of the public sends you a request directly, though, for instance, if somehow they got your email or they realized that it's you know your first initial and last name for a lot of people for email addresses. If you get one directly from the public, then it is not a proper open records request. I think that's important to understand. When they made the uh, allowance for the public to send open records requests via email, I think the legislator understood that that could be uh, very burdensome on the agency because ultimately anybody gets an open records request. You know, if they allow anybody to receive it, then you know I could get one for you know, I don't know, uh, building inspection or, or um, you know, um, somebody in um, planning could get one for police or something, and then it could get lost easier. Um, and we don't ultimately want them to get lost because it's on us if it gets lost and no one, and it never gets a response. Um, but make sure to understand that if you receive one from the public directly um, and not from the council clerk first, that you don't ignore it, you respond as it's provided in CAO Policy 8R. Uh, basically, it says um, in, in layman's terms, hey, I'm, you're not supposed to send it to me, um, and, but you should send it to this email address, OR at LexingKY.gov. And then you, you're not required to send it along to anybody else. You're not required to respond or, re or provide documents or anything like that. You just send the email saying, I'm not the right person, send it to this email address, and you're done. So also, we have the electronic form on our internet. Um, so, uh, I think divisions have, uh, uh, police and fire ha ha have their own electronic forms as well. The general one goes to the council clerk, just like an email, and then it's forwarded to the division, just like as if it was an email. So a person can go online to lexingkygovernor and fill out the form and press enter and, and sign it, sign it and press enter, and then they can get, they can send the request and it'll go directly to the council clerk, which will then be provided to the divisions that uh, are listed on the request and also ones that we might feel are, might be, have pertinent information, uh, re, uh, records regarding that request. So our policy directs people to hand deliver mail or fax to the council clerk, but if you receive uh, something hand, hand delivered or mailed or faxed to your division, please make sure you goes to the direct correct division. In those cases, the clock does start ticking five business days, you have to provide it to the right division. It doesn't, the, the timing doesn't count, doesn't start when the right division gets it, it counts when, the, when a division of the government gets it. So for those particular records, for things that are mailed, hand delivered, and faxed, for those who still use fax. 
So please make sure you get it in as quickly as possible to the right division. And if you don't know who that could be, council clerk might be able to help. Her office sends those to uh, the requests to people to uh, divisions. Um, I imagine every single day, almost. Right? Yeah, multiple times a day. I imagine so. Um, we have some practice at it, and of course, the council clerk can always ask the department of law for help. So here's a pop quiz. I had these. We had some. We had some uh, scenarios in previous ones that I still added some scenarios, but not as many. So it's not as much audience participation. So again, you're welcome. <laughs> so the first one is, Mr. X walks in the council clerk's office and asks for a copy of an ordinance the council recently passed banning sale of dogs and cats in pet stores. It's, it's pertinent too, right? This isn't even something that was like 20 years ago. I keep it updated, that's why. How should the council clerk's office respond in those cases? Just give it, yeah. Just give it to them. They don't have to fill out a request. You just give it to them and then move on. You don't have to sit there and write out a response and then give them the written response right there. Um, so it's a little bit easier for you. What if Ms. X emails a letter directly to the Director of Human Resources asking for Evan Thompson's personnel file? What? How should HR respond if they receive an email directly from a constituent? Uh, asking for records. You should send, send something back saying I'm not the right person to send it to. Send it to ORI at LexingtonKY.gov uh, and then they will and you know there might be some redactions and stuff but you won't see anything all that exciting. I don't think. So the uh, second step, once we've received it correctly, right, once we've received it from the council clerk if it's an electronic request or in the mail if it's mailed or if hand delivered you know from the security office if it's hand delivered or something like that then the next step is to evaluate it see if it meets the requirements of the, of the open records act and also is was sent to the right person or division so it, it requires us to make a couple of determinations and I use a couple a little bit uh, Broadly, right. So first, is the requester a resident of the Commonwealth? Was it made? Was the request made for a commercial purpose? Does it relate to litigation? Is it a request from the media? Uh, is it a request for information instead of records? Uh, and does the re request even pertain to your division? Right. If it doesn't pertain to your division, then you, there's no records to look for. Um, and also, uh, similarly, is LFUCG the custodian of the record? And then also. Could this request pertain to re records held by multiple divisions? And those ones are kind of the more tricky ones, which we'll talk to in a little bit. So uh, under, uh, I say recent, but time seems to be speeding up. It's probably not so recent anymore. But the Open Records Act, uh, the legislator amended the Open Records Act to, to only allow residents of the Commonwealth to send requests for records to agencies. Uh, it, uh, so in the request, the open records request that's sent to us, they're supposed to tell us how they are a resident of the Commonwealth. If it's an electronic form, we just make them check a box. Uh, and that's that. Um, but basically, it all, the, those are the ways uh, that a, uh, a person could be a resident of, of, of the Commonwealth. And they basically boil down to, do you live here? Do you work here? Do you own property here? Um, are you a, a news organization? Or are you somebody who's hired by one of those people to, um, to make a request or to do something for them? And that basically was what it boils down to is um, it's, it, it's meant to pre prevent the, uh, protect the agency from multiple out-of-state um, requesters who are uh, um, you know, sending probably more commercially, um, uh, requ commercially centric requests. Um, that are burdensome generally. Sometimes they don't say, I am a resident of the Commonwealth because I'm a, you know, I live here or something, right? Sometimes they don't say that if it's a mailed request or a faxed request or hand delivered request. Um, the electronic request, like I said, oftentimes uh, will have that information on it because we request that information from them on the actual form. If they, if they don't say how they are, but they provide a Kentucky address, then we usually presume that they are a resident because you can, if you live here, if you own property here, you're a resident. Or if you work here, you're a resident. If there's no indication on the request that you've received that a person's a resident of the Commonwealth, then 
you should uh, respond to the request asking for such a statement. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a draft uh, response. Um, it's either in the CAO policy or the, or the uh, uh, intranet under the open records tab um, that you can use. Basically says, uh, you know, you didn't provide that you're a resident of the Commonwealth. Please provide how you're a resident of the Commonwealth so I can review the request and, and fulfill it. And the clock for that, the five business days, doesn't start until after you receive that statement. So if you don't, if you get an open records request that doesn't have that and you send that letter, you just wait until they send something back. You're not required to provide the records and respond in five business days. The time will start, restart, when you get the resident statement. And also you can deny the request if it's clear that the requester is not a resident of the Commonwealth or, you know, after your letter saying, please provide how you're a resident of the Commonwealth, sometimes we get these that say, I'm not. <laughs> uh, and then say, okay, thank you. You know, your record is denied. It's good to be honest, that's great. Um, it's refreshing, actually. So in those cases, you can deny the request because they're not a, re a, a resident of the Commonwealth, and that makes your life easier. Next question is, was the request made for a commercial purpose? Commercial purpose is basically, is the requester going to be making money off of this information somehow? That's, that's the definition, and those are the things I have to read all the time, but I'm boiling it down for you. Are they making money off of it? And it doesn't include media who's, you know, selling papers or something like that, or parties or attorneys for litigation purposes, because what I imagine is, is the legislator is full of attorneys who do not want the agencies to have to pay more than they need to for records, but that's a pessimistic view. If the request is for a commercial purpose, they have to provi provide the statement, just like a resident statement, in the request. If they don't, and you believe that it is a commercial, there is a commercial purpose for that request, then you can send something to them, basically saying that you're not going to be able to process the request until you provide a, a commercial purpose certification. And in those cases, the five business day clock wouldn't start until you get that certification. Uh, generally, we take the requester at their word because it is unlawful for them to lie. So we could theoretically sue them if we, in the future, figure out that they were actually going to use it for a commercial purpose. And that's why they shouldn't lie. And if a requester is watching this, uh, it is illegal. So don't lie. And why does it matter? Why am I asking you to have to go through all these steps for this commercial purpose? Well, it's actually pretty cool. It's the only instance where we can actually charge them staff time. So you can, if it's a commercial purpose, if someone's asking for, for something where they're just going to turn around and make money off of those records somehow, then you can charge the requester for the copies, which you can always do, as well as staff time. And so that's basically you, the person who's responding to the request and fulfilling the request and getting all the documents together and all that stuff, their hourly rate times the amount of hours it took. For requests made without a commercial purpose, like a general, general request that's not you're not making money, the person's just interested in finding out more information about what the government's doing without any commercial motive whatsoever, then we only charge uh, for, the, uh, for copying costs. You charge them and then they receive it, but it's for receiving records after uh, they've, um, you know, for taking basically records home with them. The policy, CO policy 8R provides the, the amount that it costs um, for, for people who come in to inspect records uh, and want to take copies home. I'm not sure how often that, you know, I'm not sure that happens as much anymore now that we accept emails and provide records electronically nowadays. But, um, you know, if, if they want to take records home, you charge them. I th for most things, it's 10 cents a page. If you provide the records via email along with your response, giving those records out doesn't cost the requester anything. Um, we'd have to determine how much it costs to send an email. <laughs> and I'm not sure, um, you know, but it's probably just easier just to um, give it to them free, which we're doing. So basically, you send the email, and you don't charge them for the records that you send via email. Sometimes the person just wants to come look at the records. Uh, like, okay, there's a whole bunch of these. I just want to come in and take a look. Probably, like, take a picture, probably, but nowadays. But if they don't want to take copies with them, there's no cost. So just because you might have made a copy to redact something or something, you know, and they only are there to inspect them, and they don't want copies with them, you don't charge them anything. There might be some that it's, it makes more sense that just require them to get a copy, and that's perfectly fine. You know, the, 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 for, for the Open Records Act, the requirement for costs is just to reimburse the government. It's not a money-making thing, right? We're not, we're not in it to uh, 
you know, Oaks, you know, we can make we can make some money off of this. It's really just as reimbursement. So, um, you know, the way I would think is that if it's not reimbursing, uh, you know, if if we're not out the cost, then I'm not too concerned about potentially having to make copies and then charging them for it. Um, so the next issue is uh, media requests and requests related to litigation. So if it's a request from the media, then it should be immediately forwarded to the Department of Law and the Mayor's Director of Communications. I think they're generally done. I've seen a bunch of them. I'm, I'm on those email chains that get a lot of the requests for that. So that's, I, I know that happens a lot. So, but if you ever receive anything from a media organization, make sure that those uh, individuals, uh, the Department of Law and the uh, Mayor's R Director of Communications receives a, uh, uh, for information only. Also requests pertaining to litigation against the government um, should also be provided to the Department of Law for their information as well. Uh, I'm sure they will be able to give guidance um, as to uh, what should and should not be provided, but it's a lot for more information purposes, so that way we know what's being given to the other side in litigation so that way uh, we're not surprised. Uh, for those cases where it's the media, where the media might make a request or for litigation, it's the responsibility of the custodian to fulfill the request. And of course, like I said, the Department of Law is helpful in helping interpret the Open Records Act and also helping to uh, review responses. The next question is, well, is this even a request for records? And that's important because uh, under the Open Records Act, the LFUCG doesn't have to comply with requests for information. If someone were to ask, for instance, why did the, you know, send a letter, why did the Division of Engineering deny my permit? You know, they say, under the Open Records Act, I'm, I'm requesting you to tell me why engineering didn't, didn't approve my permit. We can deny that request because it's a request for information. But we do have to comply with requests for records. So they could send something that says, well, okay, you're not going to tell me the information? Well, I'm just going to ask for all records relating to the review of my application. Like I said, we can, you can deny the request if it's a request for information, um, um, basically saying that the Open Records Act requires uh, provi providing documents, not information, so your, requ your request is denied. Um, but I think it's always important to understand, uh, be careful what you ask for. Sometimes it's easier to provide information than to have to go back and give a whole bunch of records if they come back and say, you know, fine, you're not going to tell me this, I'll just, you know, ask for a whole bunch of records that now you have to do, and when all you really wanted to know was why you denied my application, for instance. Um, now also, LFUCG is not required to create records to fill requests. So for instance, if somebody asks for a spreadsheet, containing X, Y, and Z, and we don't have a spreadsheet containing X, Y, and Z, and we don't have like a computer program like a, you know, one of those uh, software as a service, like, you know, you, you plug in all the information database and it comes back as a spreadsheet. So if you don't have something like that, then you can, you, you just provide the records that would be, prov would be put into the spreadsheet, but you don't have to actually make the spreadsheet. You just say that, well, this isn't available as a spreadsheet, but here's the records relating to your request otherwise. Next question is, is whether or not the request pertains to records held by your division. If you get a request and it does not pertain to the records, uh, records in, in, for your division, then you must forward the, forward the request to the proper division. Because like I said, the five, days are, the five business days are ticking. If you don't know what division has the relevant records, consult with the council clerk or the Department of Law and we'll be able to uh, try to point you in the right direction. Sometimes for electronic requests, they're sent, the council clerk sends them to the divisions that we believe might be the most likely to have records relating to that, the, the issue in the request. Um, if you don't have records uh, responsive to the request, make sure to tell the other records custodians on that email chain. That way everybody can be working together because I think ultimately that's the most important thing when we get multiple division requests is for everybody to work together. But it's, it's beneficial for a lot of reasons to have one division send a, re send a response for all of the divisions involved in fulfilling a request um, for a particular uh, open records request. That's because for, for our purposes, right, we, um, if we're ever challenged by the Attorney General, it's easier to see, okay, this was our response instead of, here's our response from traffic engineering, here's our response from revenue, here's our response from that. We're basically having to make, uh, you know, we'll have to make sure all of those are in five business days, all of those complied with the right 
the the the, the Open Records Act, and it's it's easier for to do, easier to have for one 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 uh, one response, and also it helps the requester, right? Then sometimes if you send a request, you. Uh, from one division, it doesn't necessarily show that that was just from that division. So they might think that's the only records they have, and then they get something four days later from another division, and it gets kind of confusing for everybody. So it's easier, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's easier for everybody. If uh, it, and it's also easier for the other custodians uh, who don't have to respond to the request. Um, and 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 I always advise that it's the division who has the most records. Is probably the division that should send the response on behalf of the government, and that's uh, you know that way you get out of arguments as to well this is really request you know well this request was for that and so everybody would you know it, it, it just whoever ends up having the more most records but I think it's important to understand for email searches that it's not computer services um, you know they're the ones whose job it is is to pull the emails you know for instance if if traffic engineering has you know emails for instance. That, you know, those are really traffic engineering records. They're just being pulled by computer services. Same thing with LexCal records. Those are LexCal complaints for streets and roads, not, you know, so I think it's important that in those cases, streets and roads be the one that pro provides the response, not um, uh, LexCal, because obviously they get a lot of complaints from a lot, for a lot of divisions, and if it was just on them, that would be uh, overwhelming for that division. Also be overwhelming for computer services if they had to, do the responses and redactions for all of the, for all email searches they ever get. And this requires that everyone works together. And I think that's ultimately, you know, you'll see that bolded a lot in this presentation. For multiple division requests, it's important that everybody works together. Everybody keep in communication with each other when you have a request. Each of you help each other uh, when there's multiple divisions involved instead of the, the silo effect that sometimes happens in government. Also, get, lets people get to know each other, and that's always just generally beneficial, right? The next next request is basically then: Does the request pertain to records even held by LFUCG? So, if if the if the request doesn't have anything to do with records held by your your division, and you've checked with the other divisions to see, hey, does anybody else have anything? You know, basically, like I said earlier, everybody's communicating with each other, saying, I don't got, I don't have anything, I don't have anything, et cetera, et cetera then um, you can deny the rest request by stating that the records don't exist. And that uh, you should send a letter to the requester within five business days describing where you or others looked. And I think that that's important, that last part. Where you have to describe where you looked, so that it was actually a, you, not a cursory uh, requ uh, search. You didn't just search one place. Uh, you got to show that you're you're searching from a lot for uh, you know I searched through my records I searched through I did a computer search et cetera et cetera et cetera and nothing came up. Sometimes we know that another public entity has the records that are being requested. In those cases, we can't just do what I just said said hey, we don't have anything. Sorry, see you. Have a nice day. Instead, we have to tell them within five business days the right agency to ask for the records. Uh, to where the records can be found. If it's records relating for the, 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 council, the county clerk might have, for instance, and it's not us, we don't have those records, we have to tell them, hey, you can find that, you know, you make the request to the county clerk at uh, whatever their address is, and that fulfills our responsibility. But we can't just deny it and say we don't have anything, That's, those aren't records relating to us. Uh, we have to tell them which agency to go to. And I think it's important too, sometimes it's kind of confusing, Sometimes there is another entity who is actually the custodian of that record, but somehow, for some reason, we have the record. We can't just say, well, you know, the custodian is this person, this agency over there, go there. If we have the record, we have to provide it, uh, subject to redaction and exemption for and withholding for exemptions that I'm going to talk about later. And in those cases where we might have the record, when it really another agency uh, might be the real custodian of the record, I think generally I advise to reach out to that agency to see how they would treat it if it was their request to them, because ultimately you're all keenly aware of context of state laws, federal laws, et cetera, about records that you have to deal with or your division have to deal with all the time, right? It's just when you start getting into records about for, that other agencies typically have that somehow we have for some, some reason, then it gets kind of, you know, I don't know. I have no idea anything about this record. I don't know why it was, you know, I don't, I don't know what's, what, 
what the context is. And sometimes it's the, the other agency might have a better idea of, well, there's actually a state statute that says you're not supposed to provide that or something like that that would be helpful to you because, you know, you can't know every state law that ever exists for every record, um, the, even the ones that don't have anything to do with your division. So I think it's generally a good idea to, to check with the other agency in those cases where we just somehow have something that um, it's not usually our duty to maintain. So ultimately, the question I get, question I get sometimes is, but why do I have to respond to a request if my division doesn't have any records, right? I'm, I thought I was only supposed to have to respond to requests that when there's records relating, you know, when I have records. Well, ultimately, because someone has to. And you're awesome. <laughs> so, you know, ultimately, the, the goal is to, you know, discuss with the other, with, you know, um, other divisions who might have the, also received the request. You know, I'm talking about a lot of the electronic ones, right, where we see who else is getting the, the who else, other uh, custodians are getting the request. Um, and we, you know, discuss it, you know, and, and some, and make a determination that somebody actually do it. And we appreciate when uh, someone does it and when someone steps up to do it, that's, that's fantastic. And you get a star in my book for what that's worth. So here's a, another random question, uh, pop quiz. Mr. X from iFix Code Violations LLC, a company out of Florida, sends a request via mail to code enforcement for all code citations for 123 Main Street for the past year. How should code enforcement respond? Yeah, first I heard resident of the Commonwealth. So that should be asked, right? Because right now all you hear, see is this, like some company out of Florida. So what happens if they end up sending that, well, I work for a company in Florida, but I live in Lexington. Well, that's convenient, but um, what, what, what's the next step you should ask? Uh, assume it was Lexington. No, I, yeah, I think, I, I think uh, the, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think if it was one, two, three Main Street, I, you know, it is, and it's sent to Lexington's code enforcement, I think it's, uh, you'd obviously only be able, only provide things that you have. But also, what about a commercial purpose, right? So somebody's, looks like, it sounds like if you're at a company called iFix Code Violations and you're asking for code violations, then maybe you're uh, looking for uh, things you can go, your company can go fix. And that would be money making. So you should ask them for, for, uh, for uh, a certification as to whether or not there's a commercial purpose, because then, like I said, you can ask for money. Uh, you 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 can get staff time for it. The I think it's the it's the context. So right. So if somehow it's if it's on, uh, it, it's definitely context based. You wouldn't you wouldn't know if it was just. Uh, Evan Thompson sending a letter to you saying, I want all code violations for 123. But I think in that case, it was the, the context of, okay, this company looks like they fix code violations, that then you can, you can do that. So obviously, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that every single request for code violations is a commercial purpose, but I think it's context dependent. So in that case, it is context. The context indicates that it would be. So the next step after determining that you can, uh, that that they're a resident of the Commonwealth, that it is or is not a commercial purpose, that it has records relate, that the division has records relating to it, et cetera, et cetera, is to gather the responsive records. So you have five business days to gather responsive records and provide the re uh, a response to the requester. So it's five business days. I think it used to be like three, and then during the pandemic, I think it was like seven calendar days. Um, so now it's back to five business days. It's basically a calendar week. When you get a request for rec records, you got to check your record depositories that you might have. You know, how, how, it's all dependent on how you have different records, how you hold the records, but also whether or not, uh, and you also have to check with other, uh, other people in your department. Sometimes they will have, you know, it's a project they're working on or something like that. So uh, there's a few common issues that I've had for responding to questions. 
in the years that I wanted to discuss with all of you to help get better information as to how to respond to these issues when they come up. Emails, so complete an email search form and provide it to IT. Those forms are on the internet. Please don't make computer, computer services fill out the reform or fulfill the request. Their job is just to pull the emails for you. Now, of course, if it was, I want emails from members of computer services, that would be different because uh, that's specifically referenced for computer services. Um, now the form requires the, uh, the CIO signature and the Commissioner of Law signature, so please forward to them as soon as possible. The IT usually provides it in a, in a few days. I think there might be a problem, at least I heard recently, about issue with their email search uh, database, uh, and I think they're working on that from what else I heard. Um, so I'd check with them about if you get a request for emails, how, when they anticipate that to come back up, so that way we can better inform the public of requesters about, about when they can expect email searches to come back if you get a request for an email search. Text messages and private emails, that's one of the big topics of the age right now. The long story short is they could or could not, right? Uh, we're getting more uh, guidance from the state right now, but it's based primarily on whether or not we, the government possesses, owns, retains, or uses the records. So I remind employees not to use text messages or private emails to do public business unless necessary. Uh, it contact the Department of Law if you have a request for text messages or private emails, and we can work with you as to uh, what, uh, whether or not to provide it. And like I said, it's constantly changing, so the Supreme Court's looking into it, and we'll provide you with more information as soon as we have it. And of course, I'm going to amend the presentation once we have more guidance, so that way we'd fill in that information um, for the, the latest guidance of the age when it comes in. And please, and this is important, regardless of what the Supreme Court says, is don't require an employer officer to turn over a, a private cell phone to you. Um, that has constitutional connotations, and we don't want to get into that. So, uh, so do, if you get a request, do not say, give me your phone, your, your private cell phone, that, and, and then look through it. Do not do that, please. Sometimes, like I said, you got multiple divisions involved. In those cases, you got to work together, like I said. All custodians with responsive records should provide the following to the individual making the, fi the final response by the agency. Um, and this is just to help the individual making the final uh, response to the requester. The, the person from one division who's receiving records from another division and you've redacted them without providing what's been redacted and what exemption and all that stuff, they'd have no idea. It's just some blank spots on a piece of paper. Make sure to um, send the, all responsive records of the request with redactions. Please also provide uh, a draft letter to the custodian who's fulfilling the request as, as if you were the only division involved. So basically act as if it was just a, a, a request to your particular division but send it to the custodian who's working on it. Because ultimately, like I said, they don't have the, uh, they don't have the information to know whether or not you're you redacted things because of the personal privacy or preliminary, et cetera. But if you provide the letter, they can just copy and paste and move on. It makes everybody's life easier. The most likely way to work together is if everybody makes everybody's life easier. Um, otherwise, then people don't want to work together. Who should be tasked with providing LFCG's re official response when there's multiple divisions? They should work together. See, man, I think that's like the fourth or fifth time I've bolded this. So it's subliminal messaging. The, um, you got to work together, but like I said, I usually say this person, the division who has the most records, because they would seem to be the one that has the most pertinent records for that particular request. But like I said, it doesn't mean computer services or Lexical. They're the helpers. Uh, one of the biggest things I hear requests about is, is this a blanket request? Can I just, can I just deny this because it's, it's asking for a whole lot of records? Usually open any of these, any and all records that relate to a type of request uh, need not be honored. So you can reject, you can deny those um, if the requester seeks to obtain records by mail or by email. So if they're trying to get e you to email them or, or mail you the records, um, if they're out of county, then you can, uh, you can reject them. You have to precisely describe, for this standard, you have to precisely describe the public records. It's precise if it describes it in definite, specific, or unequivocal terms. But if you provide the, you know, some kind of identifier, then it isn't in that um, all or nothing, right? If you say emails, for instance, then that's, that's an identifier. You're not asking for any and all records. You're asking for emails. So that's something to, 
important to understand is it's really for the any and all records related to X uh, requests that are the blanket ones. So otherwise, a request is sufficient if, it, if a reasonable person can ascertain, can figure out what it's asking for. So basically, the blanket requests, denying things because there are blanket requests, should really be used in those instances when you have no, you, you can't even start to fulfill the request because you don't know what they're asking for. Um, it's not just because, for instance, they, it'll be 15,000 records and that's a lot. Um, and I think also it's important to understand that we only have to make a good faith effort to uh, produce the records, to look for the records. So basically, they, you, have, you look in the places where you think that they, a reasonable person would think that they would be. You don't, you know, it's, it, it's not, you know, you know your records the best, so I think the best idea would be, you know where they're located, you look in those places where you think they're located. It doesn't necessarily mean you turn over every uh, stone. So some things to always look for is whether or not there's, they mentioned the request mentions people involved, time frame, subject matter, and, and the type of record. Those, indic those limitations go more towards the not blanket request uh, because you're providing help to, the requester is providing help to us to determine what actually records are being requested. And also I think it's an also important and kind of to try to make you feel better about when, you're, when you get a request that's asking for a lot of records or that might be a little vague, is that it requires us to act in good faith. We can interpret an imprecise request differently than what the person meant, as long as you're, being, you're acting in good faith. So you know, let, let me try to think of an example. So if you, if you ask for um, code violations, for instance, for code citations, and you don't provide the notices, for instance, and they say, well, I was looking for the notices, too. And you say, well, you asked for citations. And I interpret that to be citations. So that's an instance where, where we don't, you know, you don't have to, it's OK to interpret it differently as, as long as you're acting in good faith. So I did some example, found some examples of what's a, a sufficiently blanket request and what, is, uh, what, and what isn't. So for instance, uh, a, re a request for a division's policies and procedures is sufficiently clear. A request for electronic copies of all email exchanged between Evan Thompson, Mark Pope, and Mark Stoops. And there won't be any, because <laughs> number one, I wouldn't be emailing them, and two, I, I'm a Notre Dame fan. Um, so <laughs> why would I even do that? Um, but that is sufficiently clear. Sometimes we get the question of, well, they didn't provide, they didn't provide email addresses. Uh, well, you know, according to this attorney general opinion, you don't have to. And they didn't provide a time period. According to this attorney general opinion, you don't have to. They're just asking for all of them. Um, of course, it could be that there's a whole bunch, right? And then that goes into a different determination of whether or not it's burdensome, which is a little bit later, which I'll talk about. It doesn't mean it's a blanket response because there's a whole bunch. And also lack of subject matter, right? That doesn't say about basketball, about tax advice or about you know, stock market or something. It's, it just wants all of them. And that's sufficiently clear for the purposes of the Open Records Act. So even something like that, right? If you get an email that says, I want all emails exchanged between people, you think, well, wait, that's a lot. There's no limitations there. And that's OK for the Open Records Act. So that's something to keep in mind. Here's another example. Any and all re records related to lab core versus any and all emails, correspondence, contracts, emails, documents regarding how many positive test results in Kentucky have been conducted through LabCorp. That's, uh, you know, as you can see, any and all records related to LabCorp, I don't even know where to start. That could be, you know, I'd have to look through every single record in the government to determine whether or not it's related to LabCorp. But the other one the, is more specific, and it really, it's just all a, a determination of reasonableness. Can a reasonable person determine what is being asked for? So the bottom line is the fact that a request may encompass a lot of records does not make it a blanket request for which you can deny. So for instance, I'm looking for emails between, with, with, I'm, I'm asking for emails for 30, with 30 employees, right? That's a lot of employees. That'll come up with a whole bunch of emails. But that the, reflects, like the IG said, burden of the search, not the inability to conduct the search. So the, the ability to conduct the search is how you can deny a blanket request, is because you can't con conduct the search because there's, it's just too many records. It could be, any, it could be anywhere. Um, these records could be unduly burdensome. 
but probably isn't according to recent attorney general. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, like I said, for 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 un um, for uh, blanket requests, the the consideration to determine whether or not to deny something because it's a blanket request is whether you could reasonably understand what's being requested. So if you get a request and you you don't understand what's being requested or you can't, um, then you know, discuss with the Department of Law and we can, you know, like I said, we're very reasonable. I'm sure you all believe that. Especially when you see some of our responses saying provide records, right? Sorry about that. The next step, uh, the other side of the coin, right, is if it's not blanket request, it could still be unduly burdensome. Uh, unduly burdensome requests can be denied uh, under the Open Records Act. It's fact intensive. I know you guys don't like to hear fa it's fact intensive or it, it depends, right? I think that's a joke for attorneys, right? People who, about attorneys is we don't actually answer your questions. We just, it depends a lot, right? Well, in this case, it depends. So we have to weigh the right of the public um, to secure the access to the records versus the, our ability to effectively execute our public functions. So unduly burdensome requests, we, we deny them because they're so big and they will take so much time that we can't actually do our jobs. And that's really why you would deny those requests. Factors, number of records implicated, whether or not they're electronic or physical format. The idea being physical format, it's harder to search through, right? You can't just control F and find words. You have to like read everything. I guess theoretically you could scan them and then convert them to P whatever, but uh, it's the, according to the Attorney General, it's more difficult to look through physical records, so it could take more time if they're all physical. And then also, whether records contain material that's required to be uh, redacted by state law. Um, there's some, and we'll get into some, some redactions that are required, like state law requires it, and there's some redactions that are not, like that are just at the discretion of the government, for instance, preliminary stuff. You don't have to necessarily redact and, and withhold preliminary re uh, recommendations, for instance, but you can. So the things that are required to be redacted, uh, that also factors in the determination of, of whether or not it's unreasonably burdensome. So in, this, in the case that I cited there, so there were thousands of physical files relating uh, where they're maintained in physical form in multiple locations, and each file was subject to Obviously, you know, it's medical, so there's medical confidentiality there. So, see, there's multiple steps, right? All adding up to unreasonably burdensome. Also, I think it's important to understand, too, that if we don't catalog our records in the, uh, the matter that they're asking for, that it could be unduly burdensome. So, for instance, like if you ask for code violations uh, by um, citations for Evan Thompson, for instance, you wouldn't find them because they're probably not searchable by name, they're searchable generally by address. Um, and obviously then we would have to look through every single record to determine whether or not it relates to Evan Thompson or not. You can't rely on, on our, the inefficiencies of our recording, record system to say, well, it's going to take us a long time because my record system is putting a whole bunch of papers on my desk in no order whatsoever and I'd have to look through all those records. So for instance, like for that, you can't deny it because we're just not organized. Um, so required showing. So it's a diff we have to show in, in your letter when you deny something because it's unduly burdensome, you have to show by con clear and convincing evidence that it is uh, uh, unduly burdensome. It's a very difficult standard to meet. We can't just say it is. Um, sometimes our letters say, you know, it's denied because it's, it's burdensome on the agency. We have to go a little bit more into that. And I, the, according to the Attorney General, they believe it's the legislative intent that public employees exercise patience and long suffering, and that's one of my favorite phrases, right? Long suffering to uh, in making public records available for public inspection. So basically, yes, we understand that it's going to take a long time, and that's sorry about that, but just be patient. So it's very helpful, right? It's very nice of them. Um, so how do you support your claim that it's unduly burdensome? Difficulty in locating or accessing the records, the amount of time it takes, uh, or other specific and relevant facts relating to that instance. So, for instance, and I have some examples that are, kind of show that. If you get a request that's, you're like, okay, that's going to be a lot of records, you can't just end there. You have to do some kind of reasonable effort to ascertain the number of responsive records that there are. So, you know, there's another step, right? You can't just. Um, well, I think it's going to be thousands of records. You have to do a little bit more than that to figure out that there's actually going to be X amount of records, and that's going to take X amount of time to look through in order to justify an undue burden standard by the Attorney General nowadays. So you describe the volume, 
in the amount of time that it takes, like I said. If, if you believe it's unduly burdensome because you, you're going to have to redact a whole bunch of required things uh, in it, you have to explain how the records contain those required exemptions. So this isn't really all that applicable in, in the government sphere, but it happens a lot for schools that I've read. Right, a lot of records schools have to do have to deal with FERPA. Right, you can't provide educational records relating to students. Well, in that instance, there's 20,000 records that are implicated, and I'd have to go through each of them, make for federally required FERPA reg um, redactions. So you can, um, you know, so that's what you have. To, you have to show not only that it's how many uh, estimate estimation of how many records, how long it will take, but also you have to describe which redactions you'll have to make in order to fulfill the request. And that's um, ultimately what the, you know, the Attorney General is looking for when, if it's ever appealed. Because ultimately, these things are appealed, you know, because people don't like getting letters that say no, right? It's, it, they don't even get anything and they say no, then they're, they're going to go somewhere to try to get us to give them the records. And it's, it's always helpful to have a, have a, something in our letter describing the burden that we have. Some examples, here's a request that was unduly burdensome. 2,153 discrimination cases where they have to go through each one of them to redact confidential stuff. 6,200 emails because of FERPA uh, redactions. Here's, here's my favorite, 11 million documents, right? So if you ever have 11 million records, that you'd have to look through, you can deny that request. You don't even have to ask me. If you have 11 million and there's redactions that you have to make, then that's something that you can obviously uh, say that's an undue burden because that would take you a significant amount of time. Here's one. Um, dispatch logs for 16 days when it implicates 42,000 calls coupled with statutory requirements regarding redaction. Here's one, the 111,000 emails some involving criminal investigations, which require redaction. You're seeing the, how these are working. It's a lot of records with the required redactions. Was not. Here's one. The, in, uh, three years of justified homicides, and then also cross-referencing the names of those involved to determine whether or not there was officer-involved shooting. And that's, that one more has to do with, you have to explain the burden, like I said. You have to show how it's a burden. You can't just say it is a burden or it will be a burden. I think it's going to be a burden. In that case, they didn't explain um, whether or not they could query the system for justified homicides. Like, you know, there's a drop down that just says justified homicides. You click on it and you get all of them, right? Or if you have to look through all records, right? So it's, it's show your work in these cases if you're wanting to de de deny because it's an undue burden. Five years in implicating 10,000 cases. Um, is not an unduly burdensome, and that was morally because, more because the requester said, well, I'll come in as many times as, you, you know, as it takes. So basically, in other words, it could be unduly burdensome, but the requester could attempt to make it less burdensome, and then it wouldn't be burdensome anymore. And you can't just deny it and say, well, it doesn't matter if you come in 40 times and you, you look at the records you know, as I produce them. Um, I'm just denying it anyway. And so in that case, the AG found that when the requester makes it easier for you, you can't just deny it for that purpose. And here's one that I think is similar in our case to what the numbers that sometimes we have to look through, especially when it pertains to emails. And that's 2,500 emails that it would take 40 hours to review and redact. That is not an unduly burdensome request, even if 2,500 emails is a lot. And I've looked through 20, believe me, I've done that. And it's a lot, and I'm sorry. Um, it's not me. You know, I put these ORD numbers. And that's to show that I'm not saying this, the AG is, so I'm just the messenger. Um, here's 5,000 is not as well. And then here's one that is important is speculative estimates aren't enough. Um, there's thousands of records, there could be thousands of records isn't enough. Um, we've got to be more specific and you just got to do your best to try to provide the AG with enough information to show that it's a real, wow, that is really burdensome on the agency, I, we, I will, you know, we don't have to fulfill it. So the more the better. More information the better. The next step is redact. So the difference between redact and withhold. Redact is obviously you, you take out parts of a record and withholding is, getting, is withholding the whole record. You can't withhold the whole record unless all of the record is exempt under the Open Records Act. So if one part of a record isn't exempt, you don't withhold the whole document, you just redact everything but that one thing. Um, and the Attorney General is getting more and more strict with that. 
And also, don't redact the original, please. Like, the original record, don't react it. Make a copy and then redact it. Uh, so that way we always have the original. Um, and also, keep a copy of the unredacted record so we know what the record looked like if you didn't redact it. Some common exemptions. Privacy exemptions. Social security numbers, email, private email addresses, phone numbers, birth dates, except year in some circumstances. Again, like I said, it's fact dependent. A lot of this is fact dependent, unfortunately. Financial information and medical records. F for social security numbers and private email addresses, a lot of these things, you can categorically redact them. Um, but for some, but um, unfortunately, names aren't generally categorically private, except crime victims, witnesses, police uh, type of things, juveniles, uncharged suspects. But I think it's important to understand that names could be redacted in certain circumstances under the circumstances. So for instance, um, names of LexServe uh, delinquent payers, are, are, you can be redacted because it, you know, it shows people, negative, people in negative light, right? I don't, if you didn't pay your LexServe bill, it'd look bad on you if, if, if somebody were to have that information. And also unsuccessful applications for employment. Those are circumstances where, it's, where the facts indicate that the sufficiently private um, privacy interest is greater than the public's right to know. So, like I said, social security numbers, you know, some of these things can be categorically private. Like I said, for birth dates, birth dates usually are, but if, if it's like a pro, if, if, they're, if they're asking for, app, for instance, applications um, for a grant that only people of certain age can get, you might have to provide that year because it shows the public that you only accepted grants from people of that age. Um, that's just a, a, you know, so usually it is, but it could be under the circumstances that it's not. Otherwise, if it's not categorically exempt, like social security numbers or birth dates or financial information or medical records, then you have to weigh the public's right to know what's happening within government against the personal privacy right that's at stake at the record, in the record. Basically, does the information you're wanting to re redact under the privacy exemption shed light on how we perform the duties, right? If it, if it sheds light on how we perform the duties, then we probably would have to provide it. But most personal information doesn't, so you can redact them in those instances. Um, there's a number of items in CAO Policy 8R that can be redacted unless, uh, unless the circumstances would indicate that it's uh, better to uh, provide them instead of redacting them. Um, there's some... Confidential rec uh, 618781C, confidentially disclosed to us, recognized as confidential, which would permit an unfair commercial advantage to competitors. So it must be, those, those must be recognized as confidential and permit an unfair commercial advantage to competitors. If you're not sure if something is disclosed to you confidentially, like for instance, uh, some stuff in bid documents, that's what I'm thinking, or LFECG grants or loans or something like that, then ask. The, ask the entity who provided it to you. They'll have a better idea to know who, whether or not the record is, is confidential or whether or not it would provide an unfair advantage to competitors. And, and also ask them why they think that. And then use that determination in your, in your letter when you're, if you're, if you're uh, withholding or redacting records because of this exemption. And these exemptions are, allow you to um, you know, withhold or redact these records. So going through a bunch of these to make sure that it's more explanation as to what all of these uh, mean and how they can be applied. Some examples of these are financial information, plans for expansion, new products, proprietary trade secrets, and the like. Um, the one that might be more applicable to all of these uh, to divisions as a whole, because we do do a lot of uh, recommend, making a lot of recommendations to each other and stuff like that via email, and people like emails, to, to re request emails nowadays, is the preliminary documents exception. One I allows you to withhold pr preliminary drafts, notes, correspondence with private individuals, other than correspondence which is intended to give notice of final action to a of a public agency. So that sounds pretty good. It means, uh, it sounds pretty good. You can withhold correspondence with private individuals, except, you know, because I imagine a lot of divisions have a role in, in interacting with the public a lot. But, um, there's a limitation on, on being able to redact or withhold because of with correspondence with private individuals, and that's because the Attorney General said so. That exception only applies, so you can only re redact or withhold records of communications with, with the public if there's something in that correspondence that indicates that they were, the individual was relying on some kind of confidentiality. 
And that's fact dependent, which is, of course, not what you want to hear. So for instance, if you look at the nature of the communications, requests that the communications be private, I'm thinking, for instance, uh, for individuals who are advocating for positions for the council, for instance, if they're discussing their personal life story of why they believe that um, a, a, a resolution that bans, um, let's say an ordinance that bans conversion therapy, for instance, right? They had a negative experience with conversion therapy and I think you should ban it, right? That's something that could be pr private because you're discussing very intimate details of your life is in a way to advocate for the position. So it's something that could be redacted, the, dis the discussion of your personal circumstances. But if I was just say, I'm Evan Thompson and I believe that this resolution should be passed, that's not something that's generally, uh, the, has some kind of confident, like ex I didn't have any expectation of that correspondence being private. So you'd, pr you'd still have to provide that in those instances. So I think that's important for those that have very public facing um, uh, roles who might be corresponding with the public that might be telling people about what the public's telling us about their intimate details of their life or that are saying, please keep this private. I wouldn't be saying this unless I, you can, you know, unless you didn't, you, unless you made sure that I, this wouldn't be provided to other people. Those are things to look for to use that exemption. And there's J, which is preliminary recommendations and preliminary mem memoranda in which opinions are expressed or policies formulated. This allows us to uh, protect the integrity of the decision-making processes by encouraging free exchange of ideas. Obviously, if all of our records could just be provided and providing opinions, we might not be as open about providing opinions as if, you know, as if everybody, if, if the public didn't get the right to know. So this allows more free exchange of ideas. But you lose this exemption once the determination um, once a determination has been made, a final determination, and the opinion on the record that you have, for instance, an email, um, is adopted as the basis of the final action. So obviously adopt means to accept, choose, or select, or to take, or follow, or choice, or assent. Um, so basically, things to think about when determining whether or not to use this exemption. When you're, you know, you have an email search, for, or you have a, a request for emails about, I want all correspondence from, let's just say, between um, council members discussing, you know, uh, the the text of an ordinance or something, right? Well, one saying, you know, I think I think it should be good. I think it, the ordinance should have this in it, and or and the person says, I think this ordinance should have this uh, that in it. For instance, um, th th what would ultimately be potentially providable is the is these um, is the records who are showing um, the the recommendation that was ultimately approved. So. You know, if if it said if if a if a program, um, for instance, in environmental services, was determining a, uh, qualifications for a grant, and multiple people in the division are saying, I think only trees of 12 feet should be you know planted under this grant, or things that should be eight feet. And another person says, I think it should be eight foot trees or something like that, right? If, if the, de the determination was that it should be eight feet, you can redact the recommendations about 12 feet. But if, if the person, if the division director says, for instance, well, I like the eight feet, that's a good idea, then it was adopted, right? I use, I use whether or not the, the recommendation was used in the determination, the final determination. If it was used in the final determination, you can't redact it or withhold it. Um, so, you know, did the, the final decision maker see the recommendation and mirror it? Probably not exempt. If the final decision maker signaled agreement, hey, that's a good idea, good, good thinking, then probably not exempt. Did the recommendation advocate for something different? Like, I think that's a, you know, why would we go in that direction? I think that's a stupid idea. And then they still did. Then that would be a, rec you know, I think you should go in this other direction. And then you, you didn't go in that direction, you can redact that person's uh, recommendation. And also, importantly, if there's no decision yet, you can redact it. You, it's exempt. So if you're in the middle of discussion, for instance, if someone were to ask you, I want all correspondence about um, this issue that's happening currently in the government and no decisions being made yet, then you can, re you can withhold and redact those records um, because they are um, still preliminary because no final decision's been made. So also, it's important to note that there are some state and federal laws that require redaction or withholding documents. 
um, attorney client, uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act, uh, inmate, there's specific rules for inmates, fire personnel records about inspections, lots of records, lots of statutes about police records, um, and then also the portions of tax returns, etc., that might have to do with the affairs of the person's business. I say that because it's portions, so, uh, you know, it's not just withholding the whole document, you can only withhold the portions that have to do with the business, so you might have to keep the business name and address in a record, uh, run reports, and then FERPA for those who might have to deal with education of students. Um, you should make sure you're aware of all federal state laws that might have to do with records relating to your division, and of course, discuss with the Department of Law if you have any questions. There's some division-specific exemptions that I think are important for certain divisions, so if you're not one of these divisions, you can take a knock, nap if you already haven't started. Um, so public records relating to prospective locations of businesses where person they haven't made the determination of whether or not to go there yet. Um, you know, protects people, protects, encourages new businesses. If we don't provide information that they're coming before they do, um, it'll encourage them to come. Um, it's probably more prevalent for economic development or planning. Uh, real estate appraisals, engineering or feasibility estimates, and evaluations on our behalf relative to the acquisition of property. So if we're acquiring property, we do due diligence to determine whether or not it's a good purchase. Those records are exempt. That obviously protects taxpayer information, right? If everybody were to know that we're interested in buying this property over there, then um, it could potentially lead to some kind of land speculation or extra costs for the government. And that's probably more prevalent for general services to the extent people actually ask for these records. Um, then there's the, obviously the test questions, scoring keys, other examination data, if you're planning to use the questions and scoring keys again. So, you know, if you, as a, as, as a division who's obviously employing people, if you use the same questions over and over and over again for your applic applications for like interviews and stuff, you can redact the questions if you're planning to continually use those questions over and over and over again. And that's probably more prevalent for HR, safety training, and other in-house qualification tests because I think they're the ones who pre pre predominantly provide records related to employment. Um, then there's obviously the law enforcement agencies exemption. Police, I know police is here and they know this one. Um, so I'm gonna gloss over it. Um, you have, obviously you have to explain how it harms the agency to have the records provided during the pendency of the investigation. Um, obviously you can't use it when it's over, um, but also recognize that there are, for, for, for police records, that there are uh, lots of other examples of, rec of, of exemptions by state law that would prohibit records being provided regardless of whether or not uh, there's a harm to the agency. And those relating to field sobriety, body-worn camera, vehicle accidents, juvenile law enforcement, all that stuff. So that's for a good slide for police. Um, remember that you have to, uh, like I said, you have to, uh, you have to show the harm. That's the important thing. It's not just always harmful. You got to show it. Uh, also, importantly, uh, requests by LFUCG's empl LFUCG employees. Employees have the right to review any documents that relate to them, except documents relating to an ongoing administrative or criminal investigation. So that is a very powerful p power. Uh, that uh, public employees have. So it's an exception to the exceptions. Basically, if an employee, an employee can get potentially, for instance, discipline-related documents after, but not, and not during an investigation. So afterwards, I can ask for all of them relating to me and get them. Um, it's an exception to the exceptions. So basically, even if, it's, even if the record has, for instance, preliminary, um, preliminary opinions about me, for instance, I can get those, even if there's an exemption for it. If a member of the public were to ask for that same record, you could redact. You can't redact that for me. So, of course, if it's, a, if it's um, required to be, ex if it's exempt pursuant to state or federal law, that doesn't apply. So if it's, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of something that, that could potentially be, I guess, uh, yeah, if, if there's a record that's exempt by federal law, then you can still reject, you can still deny the request if it relates to an employee that's asking for it. But if it's something that's not, something that's not uh, um, exempt under state or federal law, you have to provide it.
So, for example, after this open records presentation, I can request a copy of all emails with my name on it, discussing how terrible this presentation is. Um, so, obviously, it's something that's obviously a very powerful power for uh, local government or for for employees of of, of, uh, of public agencies. So, always remember when you're when you're doing things in re uh, records that can be provided to the public, in the words of Bill and Ted, to always be excellent to each other. I, I appreciate the laughs, recognizing who Bill and Ted are. That's fantastic. You guys are great people. As to those who didn't laugh, you should watch that movie. The um, last one is to draft and send the response. So you have to send, like I said, the response within five business days. Exclude Saturday, Sunday, and legal holidays. You start counting the day after the LFUCG receives it. So if you receive it after 5, that counts as the receiving it at the next business day. So if you receive it at 5.02 on Tuesday, you receive it on Wednesday. And so you start counting on Thursday. Examples. So you receive a request at 1 on Tuesday. So 5 business days would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. So you have to give it on Tuesday. But if you receive it at 5.02 on Tuesday, you can do... It would be Wednesday, so Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you have to respond on, on Wednesday. So, like I said, it's recommended that one letter be sent on behalf of all divisions responding to the request. So please work together, um, like I said. And like I said, it's usually my to do the record with the most, re the, resp the division with the most records responds on behalf of the government. And that's just, you know, it's an equity thing in my opinion. Um, so please, 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 please work together when you get multi-divisional requests. And it's, it's, it's important to understand, too, and that's a good point. It's when the LFUCG receives the request, not when the division receives it. So if, you send, if, if somebody does an electronic form uh, request and it goes to the council clerk, there's a time on it, right? If you ever look, there's a time on it. And that's the time LFUCG received it. So you use that time. So it doesn't matter that you received it the next day or two days later or three days later. It's when LFUCG received the request. And, and, and so if, if it's after five, it counts for the next day. So if, L, if, if the little timestamp, I'm using, for instance, the electronic form or emails, because I think that's probably primarily what we get, I imagine, the most of anymore. It's easier and cheaper. Um, so you know, the email has a time, right? And so does the electronic form. And so you use that time. And so um, if it's 502, it counts for the next day. So basically, you know, obviously, we're not here. Um, so we shouldn't get counted against us for a day if we if they sent it at like 11:59. So it counts. For, yeah, so it counts for the next day. So if you receive it on 5:02 on a Friday, but the next Monday is Labor Day, when would it start? Remember, it doesn't start. Uh, uh, legal holidays don't count. So then, so then, so so we received it on a Tuesday, right? So when would it? So when would we have to respond? Next Tuesday, yeah. So it would be, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. Yes, Monday, Tuesday. I have to count on my fingers. Um, yes, it would be a Tuesday. So those are, in those instances, right, we shouldn't be counted against us if we're not here. Uh, the form, I, I included a, a draft form. This is an example. Um, obviously, uh, please use the LFUCG letterhead. Provide a data response, your na the name, address, zip of the of the uh, individual, the requester, whether or not it's sent via electronic mail. That's just to help us. So if we're ever looking back in the future and we're like, well, did I send an email on that? Well, that tells you if you did, right? A lot of this is just more helpful information than necessarily legal ones. Uh, the log number, the log number is just so that way we can make sure that you have uh, that uh, it's assigned a log number, which should correspond with the log number in your log that I talked about earlier. Um, Got to should be, paste the request of the, in, the the open records request into the body. Re, you should reference redactions. State how the redactions or uh, records are available. You know either if, either attached by this email or not, or they're available for inspection, or they're mailed to you if you're out of county. Uh, name of the custodian sending the letter, and then also importantly, please uh, if you're sending this via email, attach this letter to the email. Not don't just copy and paste it into the body of the email. Because sometimes email looks wonky if it's um, if people try to use formatting, and so this is, makes it clean, and and, uh, and and it also adds a level of professionality that I think is important. 
you got to make sure, importantly, you got to make sure that we reference redactions. Um, you have to include what was redacted, reference to the statutory exception, and a brief description of how the exception applies. So you can't just say, it's, um, you know, um, I made redactions pursuant to KRS 61878.18. You got to explain what it is and, and uh, how the exception applies. So you have to be detailed enough to permit someone to make a determination as to what's being redacted um, in order to be able to challenge it. So for instance, social security numbers have been redacted from responsive records pursuant to KRS 67A, sorry, 61878-1A because the information provides minimal insight into government affairs and may be categorically redacted. Also there's something about case narratives, obviously you're, you're describing what there is, case narratives. Um, the statute reference, and then also why. And then also the same thing with the emails, right? For This is for the preliminary exception. Emails have been redacted um, because they provide various different courses of action. Um, and then you add the statute number, and then you explain why. Because either no final action has been taken, or because those recommendations that are redacted weren't actually implemented. Um, also, it's important to understand that sometimes you have a whole bunch of redactions, um, different exemptions used, so it might be easier to provide in your response which, res which redactions apply to which pages of the records you're producing. So that way it helps you to determine if they have any, uh, you know, if it's ever appealed, and it helps them understand what's being redacted, so that way they don't respond back to you and say, well, I don't know what's being redacted. You're, you're preempting them, essentially, by um, trying to be helpful. And if you need more time, then you, know, you can use the draft response provided in CAO Policy 8R. Um, importantly, you, gotta, you, you must, if you're, if you're using the more time letter, you, have, you should provide the date that the records are supposed to be, or that are, that are going to be available. The, the date, or sorry, you have to provide the date that the records are available, will be available later. So instead of saying be available in two to three business days, you say, you know, um, August 16th or something. I'm not sure what, if that's even a business day, but assume it is. So also, if you have records to provide at the five-day mark, I'd recommend to provide those records on a rolling basis. It, it adds good fit, good, goodwill, and it, it shows that we're actually actively trying to, um, to um, um, do what the Open Records Act requires. Sending it, you got an, after you draft it, after you provide the redaction, which redactions are used and the reasoning for using those redactions, you, have to, you then have to send it. Obviously, you can email it if they provide an email address. You, otherwise, you mail it. You don't fax open records responses. Um, and we provide, just so you know, the Department of Law provided sample response letters that you can use on the internet for a lot of common uh, occurrences. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, the person's out of county, you, there's, a re, there's a document for how to receive uh, copies of documents by mail. If we're not the custodian, if it's for record, information, not records, um, all those different things. So uh, I'd check the intranet for documents, and also you can ask the Department of Law to review it, which you have. And then providing it, if you're sending the records by, if you're sending the response by email, you can send the records by email. That's no cost to the, to the requester. Obviously, sometimes the file size might be so big that you can't. In those cases, you should say in your letter that they can come inspect them. Um, it's probably the easiest, otherwise you'll have to send them in multiple different ways, so it's really up to you, but I'd always recommend just having them inspect, come inspect them um, if the file size limitations give a problem, because otherwise then you'll have to try to break up the size of the file, and it's sometimes you just tell them just to come see them. And then if the requester comes to inspect the records, you can provide copies to take with them. Uh, inspection's free, but copies are going to cost you. And that basically don't make the copies until after they've paid. Uh, just a practical idea. Um, and obviously I think for most things it's 10 cents a page. If the requester's out of county, um, you, can you can mail the requests, you can mail the, the records to them, um, but they have to pay the copy fees and they also have to pay the postage. So if you're getting something from Jessamine County, a person who's wanting documents mailed to them from Jessamine County, you can mail it to them, but they, you have to you know, tell them how much the cost of the records to mail, and, and, and then they have to provide the, record, the money before you send it. And then also, don't forget in your letter, responsive letter, 
uh, response letter to provide how responsive records are being provided. So for instance, if, you're, if, if the records are for inspection, you put in your letter, records are available for inspection at you know, 200 East Main Street during regular business hours, um, you know, uh, for out of a courtesy, please provide, uh, please, you know, uh, make an appointment, but they're not required to. Um, and, but if it's emailed, you say, well, the records are attached to the email, um, or if they're, if they're going to be mailed to you, you provide that, you know, the cost of how much it's going to cost to mail the records, and then you wait until you get the money. And the closing thoughts, I know it's closing, thank goodness. The, um, remember, generally, uh, that the public has the right to government records, uh, even if the records are embarrassing or it might take a lot of time for you to actually fulfill. So the public has the right to them. Um, just do your best. Um, that's all you can do. To be reasonable, uh, don't willfully withhold documents. If you remember anything, don't willfully withhold documents. If you know there's a record and you know it's responsive and you know there's no exemption, don't withhold it. Because ultimately, if, if, that's, if, there's that, if they ever figure that out, then we can potentially be subject to monetary penalties of $25 a page a day. Um, so if, for instance, uh, you know, that could add up pretty quick, especially if the court's not going to award that until months after a court case is filed, right? That's always going to take a long time. So it's, it's gonna cost, it'll cost the government a lot of money if you do that. So please do not uh, willfully withhold. And obviously, you can't, you know, if you're withholding documents, you should have a good faith argument as to why it applies, uh, an exemption applies. And if you have a question, contact the Department of Law. Um, generally, contact the attorney that's assigned to your division or department. And if you don't know who that is, you can contact the Department of Law and we can provide that for you. So I appreciate it. The, and that is uh, all that I have for you today. Do you have any questions?